My Seven Chakras, episode 243. Trust yourself. The Seven Chakras, swirling vortices of energy, positioned throughout our body, from the base of the spine to the crown of the head. For thousands of years, this ancient wisdom has been passed on from master to disciple. What are the functions of these energy centers? And could these chakras help you unlock your destiny and find your true purpose? Welcome to My Seven Chakras, and now your host, Aditya Jai Kumar. What's up, Action Tribe? AJ here, host and founder of My Seven Chakras, the show where we dive deep into the ancient world to uncover nuggets of wisdom that will surely transform your life. So, if you are new to this show, then I want to give you a warm welcome. Now, most of you listen to the show on a regular basis, but not all of you know that we have a Facebook group called Action Tribe. Action Tribe is a supportive community for people who want to heal spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Our group provides members with a safe space to ask questions, share resources, provide feedback, and most importantly, take action. Every day, you get a new challenge that correlates to a particular aspect of your life and a particular chakra. All you have to do is read the post, decide what action you're going to take and just do it. So if you have been procrastinating in your life and you've been wanting to make a change, but you just don't know how, then Action Tribe is all you need to join us. Either search for Action Tribe on Facebook or go to my 7 forward slash tribe. That's my 7 forward slash tribe and hit request. Uh, most members get access within a day's time, so it's going to be super fast. And I'm ready to see you on the inside. And with that out of the way, we are now ready to welcome our special guest for today, Dr. Brian Boxer Walkler. So, Dr. Brian, are you ready to inspire? I am. Wonderful. So, Dr. Brian Boxer Walkler, MD, or Dr. Brian, as his patient uh, affectionately call him, is considered America's TVI doctor, having appeared on today's show, The Doctor, uh, Good Morning America, CNN Extra, as well as many local news channels across the country. Dr. Brian has authored three best-selling medical books, is a WebMD editor, and has given 230 scientific Talks. He, is, he was selected to give a distinguished TEDx talk as well. He has an international reputation as an authority on keratoconus or LASIK and other advanced vision correction procedures. So, Action Tribe, you're in for a special treat today. Dr. Brian, thank you so much for joining me. It's a real pleasure, AJ, to be here. Thanks for having me. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's begin, as we always do, with some inspiration. My question to you is, what is your favorite inspirational quote, and how do you apply that quote in your life? My favorite quote is, trust yourself. And the reason why is because so many people nowadays don't have that inner confidence to be able to trust what they our feeling or our own decisions. And we're going to talk about that too, because the book really does touch upon that. um, The book perceptual intelligence Mm -hmm. that we're here to discuss too. And I think that comes from knowledge and understanding and awareness. And when you have those components, it really does unlock a lot of things in your life. And I, I apply that because having experiences, is, is what allows you to build your confidence. Mm-hmm. And we have twin daughters that my wife and I um, are raising, and they're 11 years old now. And as, as a parent, one of the most important things that we do, in addition to providing love in a very nurturing environment, but we want them to do activities where they can accomplish something and that feedback loop inside their mind gives them that confidence. And that's um, how I've applied it you know, throughout my life. Wonderful. Thanks a lot for sharing this wonderful quote and powerful quote with us, which is trust yourself. Action Tribe, it's all about having that inner confidence to trust what you're feeling deep within. And of course, that does not come immediately. It comes with some experience, that wonderful feedback loop that you spoke about. And of course, awareness understanding, and knowledge. Uh, So, Dr. Brian, talk to us about what is really the meaning of perceptual intelligence. Perceptual intelligence, the name of the book that just got released, is where we interpret our experiences to separate fantasy from reality. Or really another way of thinking about it, it's like 
having a built-in BS detector in your head so you can make better, smarter decisions in your life. Got it. And I'm sure that all of us want to be able to make these smarter decisions in our life because, you know, we come across so many stimuli, people, interactions, experiences, and we want to be able to distinguish from uh, reality and what is fantasy as well. But before that, I want to ask you this question. How did you go from being a surgeon and an ophthalmologist working in the field of vision correction to writing a book in the field of perception? What's the story behind that? I get that question a lot because on the surface, there doesn't seem to be an obvious connection. And I still I'm an eye surgeon. I'm still doing all these procedures that you mentioned in my introduction. Right. But the reason for the book goes back well, well before I was even a doctor. I have to take, take you all back to when I was in sixth grade in elementary school, mm -hmm. where I secretly checked out from the library a Judy Bloom book called Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. And it's a coming-of-age book for girls. And I was just naturally curious how the mind of the opposite sex worked. And it was just that curiosity of how our brains work and that's where it started then in college at ucla i was a psychobiology major which is a combination of psychology and biology because i wanted to better understand the inner workings of our minds and our brains and then the real reason the inspiration that i did the book was when i was in sochi russia in 2014 mm -hmm. i was there for moral support for my patient stephen holcomb he's the u.s gold medal Olympic champion bobsledder, and he had a condition called keratoconus, mm -hmm. where the cornea, the front part of the eye, bulges out uncontrollably and can cause a tremendous amount of distortions and night vision difficulties and really just uh, ruin somebody's life. Right. Well, I, I had treated his condition with these procedures that I had developed and pioneered, and he came back from basically being legally blind, and that's when he won a gold medal in Vancouver at the Olympics there in 2010, and that's why I was in Sochi for moral support. While I was in Sochi, I, wit I, I witnessed more than Stephen winning two bronze medals in bobsled, but I also saw how Vladimir Putin was manipulating the world's perception of himself compared to what he was really doing. And that's when I started writing. And that's that was the genesis for the book. Got it. Got it. So thanks a lot for sharing that backstory. It's really amazing to note how it all started. And what I get from it is it all started from the curiosity that was within you to really understand the inner workings of the mind. And when you shared the story, what came to my mind was the book that I'm reading now, uh, which is basically a biography of Leonardo da Vinci, who was so curious. You know, everything that he did was based on his curiosity, but also he was really passionate passionate about uh, eyesight, vision, lighting, and how light behaves in different conditions. So, uh, you know, it usually happens right. that when I'm interviewing yes. a, a person, especially yourself in this field, I'm usually reading some book that correlates or something that might help me understand, uh, you know, what we're talking about today. So thanks a lot for sharing that story with us. Uh, could you provide okay. some everyday examples of how our emotions or memories even might influence our perception of reality? Definitely. Uh, I'll start with a very uh, funny one. Sure. There is a uh, coffee that is uh, called Kopi Luwak, and okay. it sounds very exotic. It's made in Indonesia from coffee beans that fall on the ground and are eaten by a special type of cat, which pass through it undigested and come out the back end. Mm -hmm. And by the way, AJ, somebody's got the job of picking out those beans and cleaning them. <laughs> and the story... The story, though, the marketing story, is that these cats have a near magical ability to pick out the very best beans, which makes this amazing coffee. And that's the reason that people are paying around $100 a cup for this coffee. Now, the reality is the coffee is, is good, but it's not going to knock your socks off. But this is an example of how marketing with a very good story can hijack people's perceptual intelligence and waste their money. And that speaks to the other aspect of perceptual intelligence. And I'll explain, there's two components. There's the analytical component, which sure. is having critical thinking skills and not accepting everything as, as fact. But then there's another component too, which is intuition and your gut feelings, which is on the opposite side of the perceptual intelligence spectrum. Because... We oftentimes, when we're waking up, 
up or falling asleep or just sometimes ideas hit us. And research is really now well established that backs us up that when you're receiving these ideas, you should at the minimum pay attention to them and not just immediately discard them Mm -hmm. because more often than not, the information you're getting is going to be helpful. It's going to be correct. And even in, in investing, it's been shown that people who invest with their intuition have been very successful and probably the highest profile person is George Soros, uh, who credits a lot of his success to his intuition when it comes to investing. So I'll tell you an interesting story too with my experience with intuition. Yeah. So when I was at UCLA, I was also on the speech and debate team and we were coming back from a tournament. We were driving on the freeway and normally I always wear my seatbelt. Yeah. And all of us were packed into the station wagon that had been donated by a, an alumnus. And the seatbelts were stuffed you know, in between the seat. So, mm. you know, really hard to get to. And I just figured, oh, just too much work. I'm just going to go without the seatbelt. So we're, we're speeding down the freeway in this old station wagon. And then suddenly I just have this gut feeling of I should just put my seatbelt on. So I just, you know, then fought the the seats to squeeze my hands through there and and get that seatbelt out and I put on my seatbelt no no more than 30 seconds later we blow a tire and the whole station wagon starts spinning around Mm -hmm. on freeway and goes off into a ditch and if I hadn't worn my seatbelt at the very least I would have been spun around inside the car right like let's change in a dryer but at the worst I would have been ejected from the window and then who knows what would have been the case with that. So that was just an example of me getting a gut feeling and then acting on it and, you know, potentially um, save my life. Got it. Got it. So as you go back to that moment, that day on the bus that you speak of, uh, what made you put on that seatbelt? Was it was it your intuition? Yeah, it was. I just had this gut feeling or that just hit me and into, an idea just came to me. It was, it was like this intuitive epiphany Mm -hmm. very strong that i should put my seatbelt on and i hadn't even been thinking about it Mm -hmm. i was talking to my friends you know we're all squeezed like sardines yeah you know into the station wagon with all the rows and that's when i started acting on it Mm -hmm. wow it's such a uh, powerful example of why we should start heeding to the messages and signs or the nudges that we get from time to time right and not ignore them because over time we start to learn how to recognize like you did on that fateful day, these the signs. So thanks a lot for sharing. Uh, so Dr. Brian, another term that I came across when you know going through your book was the perceptual filter. So could you talk to us about what a perceptual filter is and how does that influence our perceptions? It's really how our mind is experiencing everything from watching TV to reading stories on the internet to hearing your friends tell you information. Yeah among other ways. And we're always filtering everything. Okay. So when we talk about perceptual intelligence, that ability to separate what's real from not real, we have to also recognize and be aware and conscious that there are aspects of each of us that can bias or affect our ability to make these right interpretations of what we're filtering. Mm-hmm. So for example, emotions is one component. Um, how we were brought up, uh, religion, uh, DNA, uh, psychology, and other factors. And I would say of all those factors that can tamper with our ability to have really good PI, abbreviated for perceptual intelligence, I would say is emotions. Mm -hmm. And I'll explain one story of a comedy website called The Onion, which some of you may have heard about. Very funny. They do great stuff. Well, they put out a joke press release stating that Johnson & Johnson, the makers of Visine, have now come out with eye-whitening strips. Okay. So people started calling the company saying, well, where can I buy these? <laughs> and the company said, well, we don't make them. Then people started calling my office because I developed an eye-whitening procedure for people that have bloodshot eyes or brown spots or yellow spots on the whites of their eyes from sun damage or sun exposure over time. Mm-hmm. And my staff said, these strips don't exist. Some of the people then said, 
can I just go buy the Crest teeth whitening strips and put those in my eyes? <laughs> and my staff said, no, no, that's dangerous. Don't do that. Right. But this illustrates how when emotions are tied to the perception, it can lead people off the rails and perhaps into dangerous territory. And people who have discolored eyes from the sun, it's a very serious, real emotional experience for yeah. them because you know, people think that they're high or they're drunk or yeah. they're tired or they're not well. And they get the questions all the time or the looks from people. So it really affects their self-esteem and their self-confidence. And that's why sometimes those emotions can lead people in that direction without being aware their emotions are driving them to perhaps pursue something and do something that could be uh, potentially outright dangerous. So when you're more aware, at least, if you have emotions driving a direction that you're going in, then you can at least take a pause and evaluate and be critical about it and then see if, if this really is representing the truth and if this really is something you should be pursuing. Got it. So it's all about, like you said earlier, building that awareness of certain biases that exist in our mind. And when these instances occur, you can, you, you know, you can stop right there and see whether it makes sense for you to take the next step, right? Uh, you speak about another bias uh, in your book, which is called the halo effect. Uh, so could you elaborate and talk a bit about what the halo effect is and how it might lead us to not make the right decision in certain cases? We, we've all, all of us, myself included, have all at some point been on the receiving end of the halo effect and been affected by that. Yeah. What that means is whenever somebody admires someone, groups of people admire somebody or look up to them, that person that is being elevated um, mentally by people has a halo effect, mm -hmm. which means that people look up to them, they admire them, they respect them for a certain area in that person's life, but then that enables and gives permission for that person to have people listen to them yeah. in areas outside of what they were really known for. Sure. And that's why we see this effect with celebrities all the time. And Jamie Lee Curtis, who's a well-known actress, and she ranks high on the celebrity trust index. There's actually for advertisers and marketers an index that ranks celebrities in terms of how trustworthy they are. Okay. By the way, Tom Hanks is number one. Mm -hmm. And if we have time, I'll tell you a funny Tom Hanks story after. Sure. So Jamie Lee Curtis was doing commercials for Activia Yogurt. Mm -hmm. And some people might recall these. Um, but the problem with the, this arrangement was that the company's claim of improved digestion was false. So here, the company and a celebrity hijacked the perceptual intelligence of a lot of people who ran out and bought the yogurt expecting a benefit. Mm -hmm. So that's because of the halo effect. But we see the halo effect in all other situations, especially now with what's come out in the media with so much sexual misconduct of people in power, Harvey Weinstein, yeah. Luke C.K., Matt Lauer, and others, many others, in business as well. And that's because of the halo effect that people were brought in and reeled in, so to speak, because they had that admiration. Sure. And the, the, the good news of actually what's happening with everything that we're seeing in the media, this explosion of news stories, which we've never seen before about sexual misconduct like this, yeah. is that it's actually empowering a lot of people women especially, to know that since it's out in the open so much and there's so much dialogue that if they experience something like this, that now they can be more confident. We talked about confidence earlier. Yeah. That now they can have that confidence to say no and then to report it. And, um, and this is also opening up the dialogue with parents too with their children. And we had this discussion with our girls to explain what this is all meaning to educate children and not just girls, um, but boys too should be educated um, because they, they can be victims of um, sexual misconduct as well. But also it's the opportunity for parents to help educate the boys that you need to respect women. And that's really important because mm -hmm. that develops at a young age. And I think if it's not, then you have 
the Weinsteins of the world that are out doing what they're doing and abusing their power. Got it. Got it. Now, you spoke about uh, memory. You spoke about, uh, you know, how things that you do right now, you know, in, in childhood can really affect uh, what happens as an adult, right? So it's important to inculcate these values or teach these children uh, right now itself instead of sometime in the future. Uh, let's talk about memory now, because in your book, you mentioned that sometimes a vague memory or a painful incident can affect our ability to perceive reality. So are there any examples that you've seen over the years about this situation? Sure. I think if somebody has a bad experience, then, and I'll give you something just very simple. If somebody um, had, when they were drinking and they had a really bad hangover from white wine, yeah, and then they come around even as an adult and they smell white wine, yeah, that can make them react poorly and, and feel like, you know, this is a toxic substance to them. Yeah. Whereas someone else may drink white wine and say, oh, this is the best white wine I've ever had in my life. Yeah. Right. Same, same wine, but two totally different experiences. And one is because of a rather unpleasant memory of having a hangover when they were younger yeah. by, um, you know, drinking the wine. So, but there's lots of experiences too. Um, from from childhood and, and that's why with children it's such an important time because you know as, as parents that are listening you know how your children are developing right now is going to shape the rest of their life to a degree so that's why it's so important to um, spend time with kids as much as possible be interactive and there's a great quote i heard from somebody which is that um, love is spelled t-i-m-e when it comes to child raising. And that just means spending time with them. And it's not so much being with them and you're on your phone looking at stuff. It's being with them and interacting and doing something jointly with them. Like, for example, when we're done today, AJ, I'm going to be going home and uh, making gingerbread cookies with my daughters. Wow. So that's just an example of just being with them and together doing something and um it's important oh absolutely and your story reminded me of a story i heard from tony robbins i think a couple of years back uh, uh where he mentioned why he does not like beer in fact he finds it disgusting and that was because when he was a kid his mom uh you know he, he wanted to try out beer right so his mom said here here you go here's a whole glass of beer and he tried it out and he sort of spat the whole beer away because uh you know, he, he tried too much, right? Uh, but that caused such a, uh, you know, it affected his mind in such a way that it it, it uh, sort of connected beer with bad taste and disgust. And that stuck with him. And because of it, it, it serves him, right? Because uh, as on today, he's, you know, he doesn't have to have beer. He doesn't have, he doesn't crave for beer. Uh, so absolutely, completely agree with, uh, you, you know, with you saying that, the experiences that we have as children uh, in the youth really form, uh, define what, what is going to happen to us in the future. Uh, so, 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 Dr. Brian, uh, moving from individuals now to moving to groups, how does perceptual intelligence play out in groups? For example, I've read that you, uh, in your book, you speak, speak about sports teams. Uh, you know, sometimes you have these uh, sports teams that are always winning, no matter what, they're on, st you know, winning streaks, whereas some of them are constantly on a losing streak, right? And of course, there are many factors that can play into the into it. But uh, how does perceptual intelligence play a role here uh, when, you, when we're looking at not one person, but a, but a whole team? The, the book really goes through this and I'll, I'll give some examples too to, to explain the, about the, and answer the question. When you have athletes that are working together as a team, it's, it's really a great example of the sum is, is, is more than just the parts together. Yeah. And there is an energy, every person, every body, right? Every living thing has an energy mm -hmm. and when you have people that are so in sync with each other, the energy between them all can be unstoppable. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's why teams can be on an incredible winning streak. And, you know, when you have athletes, when they're well-trained, well-coached, and they're prepared, yeah. and they're all working together, it's, 
it's a beautiful thing. It's a thing of beauty. And one sport that I still do that I did in college was on being on the rowing team. Okay. And that's, I always like to think of that, that as the epitome of, of working together as a team because everybody in the boat who's rowing, let's say an eight person boat, everybody needs to be doing the exact same thing or the boat's not going to go as fast as it could. And as, as any sports team has that similar dynamic and it works in the opposite way too, where if people are not confident and mentally they think, oh, you know, there's, there's no way that we can beat this team. Yeah. And one person saying that it can start permeating and, and poisoning right. the energy of the team. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the mental state and preparedness and visualization, which a lot of elite athletes do, is so, so important. And one of the people who was kind enough to write an endorsement for the book Perceptual Intelligence was one of Stephen Holcomb's teammates, um, Kurt Tomasevich. And he explained that when his Stephen Holcomb and he, he their four-man team, when they were getting ready to go to the Vancouver Olympics in 2010, sure. They, they had cleaned up all through the season. So, you know, as they went in um, to the Olympics, they had such confidence that they just knew that they were unstoppable. Mm -hmm. And again, we talked about confidence that comes from experience. So when you have um, these experiences, it really changes your mental outlook. But this is something that everybody can use. You know, the everyday person can do something similar or and one of the things that all these athletes do is they will visualize when they're in a quiet place, maybe laying in bed, getting ready to fall asleep or waking up. They'll close their eyes and they will play a movie of what they want to see happen during the actual sporting event. And Stephen Holcomb was able to visualize every turn on every track in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, he was so good at that. And But that's something that people can do too. So if you want to have a better relationship, you can visualize seeing that relationship, how you want it to be with that person and seeing things, activities that you're doing with that person that are fun and pleasurable and going well. Uh, that's just one example of how everybody can use the technique of visualization. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to visualize seeing yourself doing better in business or doing better at your job or achieving more goals, you see yourself doing this. It's, it's an internal movie that you play. So, and that's something that everybody can, can use to their benefit. It's not just for elite athletes. Well, absolutely. And I love how you framed it, how you phrased it. Uh, every living thing has an energy and that when people are in sync, they are literally unstoppable. So it, again, it's not just one person action tribe. It's the entire team. It's the entire army. It's the entire workforce. When they are in motion, they stay in motion and sometimes uh, that can be intimidating for the other team because they note the energy. They can feel the energy. They can feel the victory. And that really is a prophecy that fulfills itself. And thanks a lot for sharing this wonderful uh, uh, strategy or this technique, which is visualization, uh, because it really helps build the confidence needed to win the game. Uh, and again, uh, this this phrase comes to my mind. I think it was Tony Robin uh, who who said it. Who uh, when he mentioned that the brain does not know the difference between something you vividly imagine and something that is real. So exactly, exactly. And I'll just give you another story here in sure. practice. Um, all the staff are always in sync with each other. Mm -hmm. What drives us is to help people, whether it's with care to conus or with the eye whitening procedure or other procedures that I do to help people with their eye issues. And everybody here has that inner desire to help people. Mm -hmm. And so when you have everybody really with the same goal on the same page, their heart is in the right place. Yeah. It's it, we hear, I mean, we hear this all the time and this is something that every organization can tap into it mm -hmm. is, and people say, I've never been to a doctor's office like yours ever before. And people fly in from all over the United States, Canada, other countries all the time. And 
everybody says that. And it's, it's just reflecting that harmony among everybody in the organization. And as organizations grow, it can be harder to do that, but so it could be achievable. And, you know, there's some great companies out there that have literally thousands of people, but Mm -hmm. they have that same sort of harmony. And uh, Zappos is a good example of that. Um, So no matter what size of the organization, it's it's achievable and it's it's like magic when it happens. Well, absolutely. And just when you said Zappos, you know, I was thinking about Zappos. I was thinking about Apple. I was thinking about uh, even Amazon as well. These companies which are literally growing uh, leaps and bounds. It's uh, not just because of the products, but it's about the employees as well who are uh, driven uh, a lot of times because of the norms or the stories that are shared within the within the workspace. But in your case, uh, Doctor. Uh, you know, the fact that you have employees that are driven and are, have a common vision and goal and purpose. Is this something that you keep in mind during the recruiting stage when you're hiring them? Or is it something that grows as time passes as the employees in the organization and, you know, uh, gets to know more about the leader as well as the other uh, people working here? It's a great question. And, you know, the philosophy of myself and my administrator is always we can tr- train somebody and we can teach somebody the technical aspects of of what they can do but we can't train somebody and teach somebody to be caring Mm. and as long as somebody comes in as a caring person a giving person then we can teach them everything else the technical knowledge that they need if somebody comes in and they don't have that inner quality in their heart and their soul i don't Mm. think we can really give that to them. Got it. I think that's that's powerful. And I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs and, and small business owners listening to this uh, episode can take that uh, note as well. The next time they're making a hiring decision is to note that, uh, you know, skills, they can be taught. But make sure you're hiring the right person for your organization. Uh, so, Dr. Brian, let's talk about the workings of a cult now as it relates to the concept of perceptual intelligence. Why do people join them in the first place? It's, it's typically because somebody is either in a funk or they're having a bad phase in their life with their family and they're feeling very isolated. So, in being lonely, Billy Joel has a really great song, Piano Man, um, and there's one lyric that says, um, they're sharing a drink they call loneliness, but it's better than drinking alone. Mm. And loneliness is really a very, very, very difficult place for somebody to be in because for many reasons. But when they have a cult or somebody from a cult come in, and cults understand this. They have this down to a very, very exact science, how they recruit and who they target. They will provide the person with unconditional love which they know the person is not receiving um, in their personal life and that immediately draws the person in because everybody wants to be loved and liked so they provide that and already now we start to see the perceptual intelligence of the fault of separating reality from fantasy fracturing because now they're thinking that this is a genuine like love that they're receiving from people in the cult Mm -hmm. when it's not but the emotions which we touched on earlier are now bubbling up and it's helping to connect and make them uh and cloud their ability to understand what's happening Uh, and the, the cults do this and then they also at times will even give people allow people to start over and give them a brand new identity sometimes even a new name. Right. And so if the person was unhappy with how their life was before, it's like saying, you know, we love you, you're wonderful, and you know what? You can start over. We'll allow you to have a new you even. Sure. And so this is very seductive and very attractive, and that's why cults can be so powerful to bring people in. And we talk about that in the book, and we talk about some you know, pretty harrowing um, situations. Um, Dr. Marvin Galper, who is a uh, psychologist, uh, we interviewed for the book. And he explains that, you know, this is a very challenging thing because, you know, he would go in with a team of extractors. It would look like the Navy SEALs, right? Yeah. Like 
rescuing somebody. Sure. In the in the cloak of darkness in the middle of the night, they would break into a house where the in the where the cult was, because parents would hire them to extract their children, mm-hmm. and they would get the get the kids out, and then they'd have to Dr. Galper would deprogram them, and that was his expertise um, with cult deprogramming. Mm-hmm. And then he made the point, though, is that it's so important once they're done that they go back to an environment in the family where it's going to be nurturing and provide them what they were lacking. Otherwise, they can fall back into the cult situation again mm-hmm. because of the need to be around people that are providing you know, the nurturing love uh, environment. So that's, that's how cults really prey on people. And, and it can happen to anybody. Uh, um, you know, I don't think any parent ever thought that had a child in a cult thought that, oh yeah, yeah, my kid's the type of kid who's going to go to a cult. You know, yep. <laughs> nobody thinks that. Nobody mm-hmm. thinks it. But you can, I mean, there was one story of a valedictorian from high school who in college was in a funk and she ended up being in a cult and got out eventually. Right. But, you know, who would think a valedictorian out of high school who has everything going for her would end up being in a cult. So Mm -hmm. so just always appreciate that it's a possibility and, um, and to have that awareness again, when you have awareness, that's your biggest weapon when you're aware. Got it. And, and and what you're sharing is really, really powerful action drive. I'm not sure if you are taking notes or noting it down right now. Uh, but if you're driving, of course, you cannot take notes. But, you know, just uh, thinking about these points, uh, unconditional love, having this brand new identity and opportunity to start afresh and being a part of a community. These are all intrinsic motivators. They're beyond identity. They're just intrinsic motivators. And it's not about who you are. But if you crave these things and you're not getting it from where you are, then it either forces you to join a cult or if a company that is creating a great product offers these things, then you can have something like Apple, right? Or some other company. And they're also sort of like a cult, right? The cult of Mac, because they do, uh, if you're part of a wonderful team, you have this uh, team love, you have this camaraderie, and you have a re- new identity as somebody who is serving or, or, or helping uh, spearhead a new technology or a new software. And the difference, though, is, of course, with cults is people really give up their freedom. Yes. Um, it, it's, you know, that's also the difference between religion and cult because mm-hmm. you have some of the elements that overlap, but yeah. a cult, they, they take over. They take over the programming of what you do, whereas religion doesn't. It provides a framework and mm-hmm. provides a, um, a background um, for people and their families. And, and that's, that's, that's the main difference. Got it, got it. So, Dr. Brian, uh, we spoke about intuition a short while back, but according to your experience, based on the people that you interact with, do you feel that people use it enough these days, intuition, gut feeling? I think it's lacking, and I think because people are never generally, it's not taught in schools, like right. we learn how to be analytical in schools, which is a lot less now than it used to be which is why people are finding the book and the information in the book so powerful to help them. Yeah. But especially when you talk about something very intangible like intuition and gut feelings, it's that's not really ever taught in school by and large because there's not a lot that we can go to and, and show this is what your gut feeling looks like. We can say this is what electrical impulses look like you know, yeah. from the moves in your body, and this is what blood flow looks like, right? It's tangible. We can see it, we can measure it, but when we talk about these soft areas like intuition and gut feelings, um, because you have to come upon it, like the people in your tribe obviously found their way to you, and this is one way that people can learn about that. Mm-hmm. But usually, if you don't have the lucky enough experience of, of the, like being in, in your tribe, people may not have any idea of, of that and that it's something that they should pay attention to. So you know, we are having, I would call it not a constitutional crisis right now in our country. It's really more of a perceptual crisis mm-hmm. in our country and people not being 
being in tune with your intuition and gut feelings is part of that. Thanks a lot for sharing. Now, Dr. Brian, uh, for someone listening to the show right now, uh, if you had to share one action step for improving his or her perceptual intelligence, what would that be? What would you encourage our listeners to do right after this episode? I would suggest to be aware and especially if you are finding yourself emotional about something, even if you're in a heated conversation, these days we don't talk to people the way we used to. It's, it's like people are yelling yeah. uh, because they feel so strongly about their positions, um, regardless if it's politics or about a product or, or anything. And so we need to be aware, and that's, I think, the most important thing is be aware of what we're doing and what we're experiencing and if we're aware then we can realize we're getting emotional about something then we can at least take a three second pause three three deep breaths and when you take three deep breaths as you know you start to change the physiology in your body and in your mind and you can start decompressing what was otherwise building up Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that can reverse the direction of the emotions by just taking those three deep breaths and it allows you that moment that you need to be able to not continue down a road, which if it was going in the emotional direction, you know, it might be something that could lead you to say something that's regrettable or to do something Mm. that's regrettable because it was so emotional. So there you go, Action Drive. It's all about being aware of the situation, being aware of the biases that might be there uh, in your mind. It's about using your gut feelings more and it's all about breathing when you really need to deeply so access the show notes for today's episode to read the inspirational quotes the book recommendations and other nuggets go to my seven chakras.com forward slash 243 that's our website my seven chakras.com forward slash 243 obstacles cannot crush me every obstacle yields to stern resolve this is a wonderful quote by leonardo da vinci action tribe obstacles come in every person's life that's one of the reasons why i focus on stories about challenges on our show to show you that you are not alone in these tough times but you must remember that these challenges are here to strengthen you physically and mentally because once you overcome them life will never be the same again you may be in a situation where you don't know what to do next But that's all right too. Don't avoid seeking help or assistance from others. Sometimes when the problem is looked at from a different vantage point, from a different perspective or a different viewpoint, it might not be so bad after all. So take help. Don't give up. And remember that every obstacle in your life yields to stern resolve. So Dr. Brian, take us back to a time in your life when you had to face a big challenge. How did you confront it? And what steps did you take to overcome that challenge? issue. I had an experience in my professional career that I was asked to give a TEDx talk about actually. And so I'm going to explain is detailed in a TEDx talk that can be found on YouTube um, by searching my last name, Boxer Walkler TEDx. So as a keratoconus expert and somebody originally trained to do cornea transplants, which are very invasive and painful and have a very long recovery for keratoconus, that condition that causes the cornea to bulge out and cause distortions, I had developed a procedure at the time called C3R, which was revolutionary because it strengthened non-invasively the cornea, which is the outer lens or windshield of the eye, so it would stop the bulging and prevent people from needing cornea transplants. It was a combination of vitamin applications with a special type of light. It took 30 minutes, Mm -hmm. and it was a one-day recovery. So it was incredibly revolutionary, and I was having very good success with it, so much so that the cornea transplant surgeons were starting to criticize me for this. And I remember my very first talk that I gave at a scientific meeting, I thought it was going to be like in the movies, where somebody goes up and and, and to a conference group of hundreds and hundreds of people and makes a scientific presentation And then you get a standing ovation, and I I gave my talk to all these eye doctor, eye eye surgeons, and I was shocked because I had a few half-hearted claps, and then I had 
I just wasn't a, a clear of what was happening. And I got off the podium. And then after my talk, I had doctors even coming up to me saying, like, I don't believe you. You should just keep doing cornea transplants, Brian. I was young. And I was, it was early part of my career. So I was younger at that time. And, it, I mean, this was very challenging for me because, you know, here I had been somebody, who, my previous presentations and my research, you know, been well received. And now suddenly I was getting ostracized from the field. Um, just hammered and doctors telling patients who were thinking about coming out to see me, oh, don't go do that, you know, what he's doing. They even say what I was doing was illegal and I should be mm -hmm. put in jail. And they were telling other doctors this too. So all this stuff was happening in my career and it was a pretty dark time. So I had this discussion with my wife of whether I should just give up doing the C3R procedure because then I would be back in the quote unquote old boys club mm -hmm. um, and things would be smooth sailing again. And I, you know, I just realized, and, and we, I talked to her, I remember in the middle of the night and I just realized, you know, I became a doctor to help people. And even if that meant sacrificing my career to help people, I'm willing to make that change and trade because at the end, end of the day, I'm here to be a doctor to help people. Because like, I found out afterwards that the cornea transplant surgeons were not liking what I was doing because it was they were losing business. Yeah. Right? They're not, you know, people aren't having cornea transplants if I'm able to prevent them from needing them. Mm -hmm. Well, then everything really changed when, and I mentioned this earlier, Stephen Holcomb, um, at the time he had lost his vision due to keratoconus and had to retire from the sport of bobsledding. He had seen 12 other eye doctors. Everybody told him you need a cornea transplant, and that would have put him out of the field anyway. But the U.S. bobsled team and the U.S. Olympic Committee, you know, he was the best driver they had seen for a long, long decades. And he was the best chance of them winning a gold medal. So he came out to see me. I treated him. I restored his vision with another set of implants. And he ended up being 2020, comes out of retirement, starts piloting, driving the bobsled, and he wins a gold medal in 2010 at the Vancouver Olympics, which was the first time for the U.S. in 62 years. Harry Truman was president the last time the U.S. had that <laughs> accomplishment a long time ago. Well, all the media coverage after that, it just put the procedure on the map, and I eventually renamed it for him in his honor, Holcomb C3R, because he really saved the procedure. And that, after that, that kind of shot a uh, bullet through the vocal cords of the critics that I had. And um, so it's been fine ever since. But, but that was a dark chapter, though. And because I had the confidence to believe in myself and not yield to essentially peer pressure that you might think of, you know, in school, like you get, this was professional peer pressure. It was really no different. And I stood my ground because I believed in myself and I believed in my procedure. And I think that's an important message for people tying back to what we first mentioned about having confidence in yourself. Mm. And the book and the information in the book really gives people those tools. And it's like little flashes go off in their head mentally after they get through this information in the book because it helps people see things in a whole new light that they never saw before. And it gives them now this power to have mm. control and more confidence. Wonderful. Thanks a lot for sharing this really inspiring story. And many of our listeners listening to this episode right now, even though they might not be from your field, they will surely be able to relate to this situation where you developed a new procedure, C3R, which was amazing because it uh, prevented cornea transplants and it had a short recovery cycle, just one day recovery. Uh, you had a lot of success and you were expecting accolades and praises, but instead you received a lot of criticism from your pe peers, like professional peer pressure, like you mentioned, people telling you what to do and what not to do. And this was, of course, challenging because you sort of, uh, it seems, felt like an outcast from all these comments from people. Uh, and then you just had this discussion with your wife about what to do next, right? So do you go back to your normal life and be amongst your peers or take the risk 
and make the change for the good of all, for the people who you serve. And you sort of had this moment where you went back to the reason why you became a doctor in the first place. And and that helped you gain the confidence and you resolved to, you know, take action anyway. And of course, when you had this opportunity to help the, the bobsled champion who won the medal at the Olympics, that, that, that really helped you really strengthen your case and all the critics were silenced. That is a superb example for all of our listeners listening to the show to listen to their intuition, listen to their gut feelings and listen to people who they trust, whether it's your wife or your husband or your kids, as opposed to listening to peers who have nothing but to criticize you. So thanks a lot for sharing. My pleasure. My pleasure. And like I said, my TEDx talk is on YouTube um, to to view it if people would like to. So they go action tribe to listen to the entire TEDx talk, go to YouTube, type boxer walkler we'll have the link up in the show notes as well and you can listen to the whole or watch the whole video and if you're still with me it means that we have really connected on today's episode and i really appreciate your attention and intention in joining us for this session as we proceed i want you to take a moment to notice things around you things that you would not have noticed otherwise maybe how the water falls into that cup how the light hits your eyes during sunrise how the pigeons all perch together on the wires above and how they fly together how the fire burns and dances when you light the candle how the entire forest sings when you're in the middle of the forest just like a life symphony and how a baby looks at the world around it trying to make sense of it all trying to take in the information and trying to learn action taker start looking at things like you've never looked before Today's topic is all about perception and vision and how you interpret things because very soon you will realize just like I am doing too that everything happening is happening for a reason. Every species is here for a reason. Everyone is playing their part and it's all working together wonderfully because just like the artist, the scientist and genius Leonardo da Vinci once said, learn to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. So, Dr. Brian, as on today, what is your life purpose? My life purpose purpose is to help people. And it's not just as a doctor. This morning, I I went rowing this morning, and once a week I have a big um, stockpile of socks in my trunk of my car, and I always, once a week, personally give out socks to the homeless. And it's just another way of trying to help people. Because I believe that's my purpose. And I've been doing that for probably over 10 years now. And I do it anonymously. You know, I'm dressed Mm -hmm. in my sort of workout gear, rowing gear, so nobody knows who I am. And I just really love that one-on-one interaction with people. And I see how much of a difference something that we take for granted is getting up in the morning and just putting on a pair of socks from the drawer. You have people like this. This could be the biggest thing that is experienced, you know, for them in a whole week. Um, so it's just so powerful to be able to give back and to help people. And really, I give credit to my mother-in-law, who's so wise, and she has a great expression, which uh, probably got me even in the direction of doing what I'm doing with the homeless, which is it's just by the way the cards are dealt that you are helping and not being helped. That's, that's really amazing. And of, of course, I, I strongly believe that when you plant these seeds of action, when you do something with no expectation in return, it always comes back uh, in some form or the other. Uh, we don't know how, but that's just how the world works and how the law of attraction works. When you give with no expectation in, in return, it's like you know things just come your way. So thanks a lot for really inspiring us to do something small, something simple. It doesn't have to be big, and nobody has to know you even did it as well. But you know you're being watched. Uh, and with that, we've arrived at the very last round for today, which is called the Wisdom Round. Say, Dr. Brian, what is the best advice that someone has ever given you? I would say the best advice that somebody ever gave me was, which is what I discussed in the beginning, is trust myself. And when you trust yourself, then you can follow the path that you were meant to be on. And sometimes people resist it, I think, at some point. But when you have these gut feelings, you have the intuition, that's something you need to pay attention to. And at the very least acknowledge that you're receiving some information and evaluate it 
and then see if it makes sense to act on it. But trust yourself. Believe in yourself. Got it. So name one personal habit that keeps you strong, keeps you going. Exercise. I've always been working out in sports one way or the other for most of my life. And I think that it helps clear the mind, helps clear the body. And great expression, if you don't use it, you lose it. And you mm-hmm. need to use your body and that helps your, your mind think more clearly, too. I know if I stop exercising for several days, I start to feel in my head even a little bit fuzzy. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, like you're, it's, like flushing, it's like flushing out the byproducts of metabolism, essentially, from everywhere in your body when you exercise. And you, you, have, you feel good. It's good for your body, too. And it's good for your mind. So that's, that's an important daily regimen for me. Great. So do you have a morning routine? I will uh, work out before I go to work. So for me, that's always the best time. And, um, you know, I'll stretch afterwards as well. And that's a routine for me too. Got it. So name one book that you'd like to recommend for our listeners today. Benjamin Franklin is a huge idol for me. And I would say his autobiography is a great book. I come back to that several times. Can't read it too many times and it's got so many important life lessons so many important life lessons lessons in his autobiography got it i'm currently reading uh the biography of uh, leonardo da vinci but that's benjamin franklin is definitely next on my list really awesome uh, personality action tribe i know how much you love our book recommendations and i know that many of you get these books as soon as you hear them shared on the show and that's why audible.com is offering action tribe one free audiobook download for uh, and a free trial for 30 days so that you can get to check out this service if you haven't already now audible in case you don't know has many titles 180,000 titles to choose from for your various devices including bestsellers like the chakra system by anadia judith autobiography of a yogi by paramahansa yogananda and a new earth by Eckhart tolle to download your free audiobook today I believe they have this uh, book as well by uh, the autobiography of ben- Benjamin Franklin. All you need to do is go to my7chakras.com forward slash free book. Once again, that's my7chakras.com forward slash free book to start listening to your book. I might add, AJ, is uh, for the audio of, of perceptual intelligence is, you know, I've listened to a number of books as well that were narrated and I always wanted to make sure that I would do my own, own book reading and so on audible.com uh it's actually me reading the book so perceptual intelligence so wow my all my personality is in there too and there's some funny things too awesome so action drive uh we have dr brian's book as well as on, on audible uh so you have options so the book's name is perceptual intelligence the brain's secret to seeing past illusion misperception and self-deception you learned a lot today this is your opportunity to dive deeper into the different topics as well as stories really fascinating stories that dr brian shares so dr brian thank you so much for joining us today Uh, before you go tell us one thing that you are really grateful for and tell us how we can find you online i'm really grateful for my my family and my friends and my health and more importantly, really, is to be able to do what I'm doing, which is to help people. And the book is one way that I'm also helping people, a very different type of help than in my practice. And, you know, the book really elevates people's games so they can have what they want in life, whether it's better relationships, better job, better sex, more success, more happiness. And, and in a way, without the information in the book, people will have a hard time achieving those things because they keep repeating the same pattern. So the information there does elevate people's potential success in every area Got in their it. life. Oh, and people can find me at perceptualintelligence.com. And my practice information is at boxerwalkler.com. And we didn't have time to talk about the chapter on sex aj but there is an amazing chapter on sex so absolutely do go get it now on amazon or anywhere books are sold so we'll have all the links up in the show notes action tribe uh this was a superb episode 
a lot of stuff learned about the workings of the mind of the brain as well as biases that you need to be aware of so dr brian thank you so much for coming on our show talking to us about perceptual intelligence and taking us one step closer to a human revolution my pleasure aj have a wonderful rest of the day you are listening to my seven chakras go to my s e v e n chakras.com download your free gift get inspired and take action transform your life today